so this is going to be the last session on the application modernization stack. Uh, my name is Srivan Dattanayaka. So as a partner solution architect uh, focusing around Microsoft technologies at Amazon, my daily job is to help a lot of our customers to run Microsoft workloads great on AWS. So in this session, we are going to learn how you can easily integrate uh, Microsoft uh, DevOps technologies, like uh, Team Foundation Server or Azure DevOps Services uh, with AWS. So we are going to learn how we are going to create uh, infrastructure as code uh, with the AWS Cloud Formation. We are going to deploy an ASP.NET Core web application into our managed web server environment with Elastic Beanstalk. We are also going to do hybrid deployments with AWS Core Deploy, and then finally touch how you can do uh, container deployments at scale. And we are going to do all of this with the help of Azure DevOps Services. So AWS provides a lot of tooling and integration for uh, Microsoft shops or Microsoft developers. And we provide SDKs for uh, .NET Framework. You can program with the help of PowerShell or command line interfaces. You have tooling available for Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code if you like to program using them. But in this session, uh, we are going to focus mainly around uh, AWS tools for PowerShell and also AWS extensions available in Azure DevOps Marketplace. So what is uh, Azure DevOps Services? Uh, Azure DevOps Services are a set of tools that allows developers to program and then release their software easily. So that includes Azure repositories. Uh, AWS equivalent is AWS uh, Code Commit, which is a JIT repository. Then you have Azure Pipelines, which allows you to run a set of steps in your deployment lifecycle. AWS equivalent for that one is AWS Code Pipeline. And then there are some other services like Azure Boards uh, and also test plans to manage your test cases. But in this session, uh, we are going to focus around how you can uh, use Azure repositories, uh, Azure uh, Pipelines, and also the extension marketplace to easily integrate with AWS. So in the first session, uh, let's uh, go through uh, how you can do an integration with AWS CloudFormation with Azure DevOps, and then manage your infrastructure as code. So what is AWS CloudFormation? AWS CloudFormation is a JSON or YAML formatted document where you can specify the databases you want, the EC2 instances you want, or the auto-scaling that you want to have as code. So once you write all the resources that you want to have on AWS as a code, you hand over it into uh, AWS CloudFormation engine, that will uh, read that, understand it, and then orchestrate it on behalf of you. So if you have a very complex solution, let's say you want to deploy an S SQL server stack uh, with active direct integration, you can divide it into uh, small stacks. For example, you can have an uh, enterprise-wide uh, network stack um, where you standardize how your network should be. Then you can have on top of that how your active directory stack is going to look like. You can then deploy your SQL server stack on top of it. So a complex solution you can organize into small stacks. So if you want to know the depth and breadth that the cloud formation can provide when you are provisioning your infrastructure, a uh, good place to look at is AWS Quick Start, uh, where you can go deep and then understand uh, what kind of complex infrastructure that you can provision with the help of AWS cloud formation. So what we are going to build now is we are going to create a very simple network stack uh, with the Visual Studio Code, put it into Azure repository, Kickstart an Azure pipeline, and with the help of Azure built agent running on an EC2 instance, we are going to uh, invoke AWS CloudFormation engine, and then uh, orchestrate a simple uh, virtual private cloud and a subnet inside that. So the application is called MyCat application uh, for the best interest of time because uh, we have a very limited amount of time. I have recorded everything as a video uh, so that you can quickly go through what is essential. So here I have a simple cloud formation template or written in JSON document. So you have your network stack where I have defined the CIDR block that you want to have. And inside that also I have specified the subnet that you want to have. So in this case I have one VPC and a subnet that specify a CIDR block of 10.0.1.0.24. So this is the cloud formation. So back in my Azure DevOps pipeline, I have created a pipeline, added a cloud formation deployment task now, this CloudFormation deployment task came 
as part of an extension that I installed from Azure DevOps Marketplace. So if you go into uh, Azure DevOps Marketplace, you will find uh, some extensions available for you to easily integrate with AWS. So that includes if you search AWS, uh, you will find an extension that you can install in either TFS or Azure DevOps. So once you install this plugin, it's uh, just a matter of clicking Install button. Uh, you can create a connection into AWS. So what you do is you would go there and then create an IAM user, get the secret key and access key, and then uh, you have access to all the AWS API. Uh, if you want temporary credentials, you can also assume a certain role and then use those temporary credentials. So once you create this connection, so in this case, I'm going to create my test connection. This is available in your pipeline to easily uh, integrate with AWS. So back in my uh, pipeline, in the task, you can see in the dropdown, I have my uh, app uh, connection already available. So in this case, I'm not going to specify this connection because I'm going to give the uh, permissions to my built agent running on EC2. So let's see how we can do that. So of course, I need to select which uh, CloudFormation template I want to deploy. So I select it from my Azure repository. Uh, so the network template I already selected. So the next thing I want to do is to um, save this pipeline and then kickstart it. But before that, let's go into my built agent. So the built agent is now running on EC2 instance. So remember, we, I didn't define a connection for this. So in this case, I'm going to provision the permission needed for this uh, provisioning of the CloudFormation template with the help of an IAM role that I attach into EC2 instance. So I have this DevOps build machine role that I have set up. So I'm going to use this role and then going to specify the permissions that I want to have. So if you look at that my cat app policy that I have defined, I can define a fine-grained permissions over here. So that includes, for example, uh, if you look at the permission that I have defined, you can find that it has cloud formation describe, uh, cloud formation get list uh, permission that I have specified. You can go into fine-grained principles. For example, if you look at create, delete, update stack, that is available only for a cat home uh, stack. So when you are provisioning this, it's not going to affect, for example, any other cloud formation that you have deployed. So maybe you want to make sure that this pipeline affects only the cat home. So on top of that, I have specified some extra uh, uh, permissions that I want to provision this stack into AWS environment. So it's always recommended to give the minimum permissions that is needed. So the next step is to, of course, kickstart this pipeline. So I queue a new build. I have my AWS build pool already registered. My built agent is already registered under this build pool. So let's queue a new build. So when you queue a new build, it's going to execute all those uh, uh, steps that I have defined in my pipeline. And obviously, it's going to take the CloudFormation template, uh, run it, and then deploy it with the help of CloudFormation task I have added. So this kickstart a new CloudFormation deployment. If you go to the CloudFormation section of AWS, you can find that a create is all in progress. So this is going to create the CloudFormation and then going to orchestrate that simple uh, VPC and the network stack in that. So far, so good. So if you go to the, uh, this cat home, you can investigate what resources that it orchestrates. So it includes the VPC and the subnet that I have created. So back in my VPC section of the AWS console, if you search for cat home, the VPC is already available. And how do you know that it came as part of CloudFormation? Look at the tags, and it gives you the ID of the CloudFormation uh, execution. So the next thing is to look at where, whether our subnet is created. So let's go to the subnet section. And if you search for the cat home, you will find uh, a one subnet provision uh, with that. Now, this is easy. What if you want to make another modification? So of course, ch requirements changes. Let's say I want to add the new subnet. The best practice of cloud formation is that you always uh, maintain your code as infrastructure, infrastructure as code, and any modification also you do it with the cloud formation. So I added a new subnet called subnet2. Uh, I changed the CIDR block for that. And this is also I'm going to maintain in my repository as a version control infrastructure. So I save it, and then of course I'm going to give a message saying, hey, I added a new uh, cloud formation template, uh, subnet into this, and then I'm going to save it and I'm going to then uh, push this one into the remote repository running on Azure repositories. So from the time I push it, uh, there's an automatic triggered setup that will automatically kickstart the pipeline, and it will again deploy that. So here I simulated a developer making a change and then starting the pipeline automatically. So it's going to run the same steps uh, that we have defined before, 
And what will happen now is uh, it's going to uh, provision the stack, but this time it's going to be an update. So it knows how to do delta changes. So it's not going to delete the existing VPC or the subnet, uh, the first subnet we added. It's going to only add the extra subnet we add. So you can do delta changes, uh, push the delta changes with the help of cloud formation. So uh, with the magic of video editing, like update is complete. You can find the uh, two subnets is now already available. And if you go to the subnet section, you can find that extra subnet is already added. So what we uh, discover here is that there are extensions available in the marketplace. So this is managed by AWS, which will allow you to easily integrate with AWS S3. You can integrate with uh, Lambda Functions, Elastic Beanstalk. So there are a lot of plugins available for you to integrate. If you're using any other system like Jenkins, Travis CI, or TeamCity, uh, you may not have plugins. So still, you can easily integrate with AWS Command Line Interface or PowerShell. So all of these uh, uh, CI-CD systems allows you to integrate easily with uh, Command Line or PowerShell. So in this section, we are going to learn how to integrate Elastic Beanstalk with Azure DevOps. So Elastic Beanstalk is a uh, uh, manage web server and batch server environment. Uh, so we provide the infrastructure, so the auto scaling, the patching, the maintenance of is taken care for you. So you only focus on your code. So in this case, I'm going to focus only around my ASP.NET Core web application. You have it available for Java, .NET, PHP, Ruby, Python, Docker. And if you want to have another custom application, let's say you want to have your own uh, web server environment or a different graphic library, you can customize an image and then provide for that, and it will still function well. So what we are going to build today, uh, we are going to create a very simple ASP.NET Core web application, push it into Azure repository, uh, kickstart Azure pipeline, and with the help of built agent, I'm going to create the web deployment package and then push it into an S3 bucket. So zip file I'm going to create and put it into S3 bucket, then invoke Elastic Beanstalk API, uh, and then say Elastic Beanstalk, hey, I have a new zip file in my S3 bucket. Take it and then deploy. So let's see how we can do that. The application is called My Tiger application, like before I uh, edited this video so that uh, we can quickly run through this demo. So I have my Elastic Beanstalk environment, uh, My Tiger app environment. You can have multiple uh, environments for that. You can have development testing, any number of uh, pre-production environments. So I have my development and production environment. They are all green, healthy state. So if you go into your development environment, you can find that my web application is running. If you start look at it, it's a very simple ASP.NET Core web application. Right? This is already deployed. It's running the version 1 of the application. So what we want to do is to publish a new version into this. So back in my Azure DevOps pipeline, I have the normal build steps to build this web application. So this is a .NET Core web application. So I'm going to take the Nuket packages, build it, test it, and then publish it to um, uh, the staging directory. So once I publish that, uh, I'm going to create a manifest file and then copy into the root of that uh, staging directory. So this manifest file is a very simple JSON document that describes uh, where on the IIS uh, location that you want to publish this web application. So in this case, I want to publish to the default website. You can have multiple web applications published with a single package if you want. So I you specify this JSON document. And once I specify it, it will be on the root directory of that uh, staging directory. And then I'm going to create a zip file in the next stage uh, under Elastic Beanstalk deployment zip file. I'm going to zip everything together. And then I'm going to upload that one into S3 bucket, uh, all the zip file. And finally, invoke Elastic Beanstalk API to publish this zip file to the Elastic Beanstalk environment. So I specify what's the region, what's the Elastic Beanstalk application, what's the environment I want to publish, and where to take that uh, deployment after artifact from. So my pipeline is good shape. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is to uh, do the same thing, but with the PowerShell. So we already know that you have extensions. What if you don't have extensions? So the previous steps are the same. Uh, so you have the build steps, creating of the zip files. They are the same. But instead of using extensions, I'm going to do it with the PowerShell. Uh, most of our APIs are exposed in PowerShell and command line. So instead of uploading to S3 bucket using an extension, I'm going to use a PowerShell to do that. So if you look at the uh, PowerShell window here, 
uh, you can find that uh, here I have specified right S3 object. So here you can find that instead of using the extension, I'm use invoking the AWS Power PowerShell commandlets uh, to publish that uh, zip file into S3. And then, of course, I'm going to use uh, Elastic Beanstalk deploy uh, PowerShell script to kickstart a new Elastic Beanstalk deployment. So here I specify what's the application I want to deploy, what's the environment I want to touch. So once you have this PowerShell script, so let's make a simple modification to the home page of my web application and then get it working. So in this case, I'm going to change it to uh, the version 2. Full pipeline is done, but I'm going to do it with the PowerShell. Right? So I give a message like uh, PowerShell. So once done, uh, I'm going to, like, like before, going to save it, give it a message, because this is I'm going to maintain in my repository. So I have a track record of what changes I made. Uh, so you save it, and then you are going to publish into Azure repository. So like before, I have a trigger set up. Whenever there's a new change, it will kickstart the Azure pipeline. So the pipeline is already running. So if you look at that, it's going to execute those steps that I have defined before. So it's got the uh, package downloaded into staging directory, or into a build directory. Uh, it's going to get the Nuket packages and then uploading into that uh, build artifacts into S3 uh, folder. Uh, and then it's going to run Elastic Beanstalk uh, deployment. And there's a while loop I keep checking whether Elastic Beanstalk environment is live. So what will happen is that from the time that you publish it, it's going to wait until that environment become healthy and become live. So if you go into your Elastic Beanstalk environment at this moment, you will find that uh, it's in gray state because a deployment is happening behind the scene. If you want, you can do rolling deployment so that the end users will see minimal downtime. But in this case, I'm uh, using a normal deployment. And uh, it takes some, a few minutes to do this deployment. You need to copy the files, restart the web server. So with the magic of fast forwarding, I got it working. So if you go into your uh, web application, you will find that uh, the welcome version 2 full pipeline is done using PowerShell messages appearing. Elastic Beanstalk also provides uh, some other mechanisms to manage your environment. For example, you can clone your environment. Uh, you can swap the URLs. So maybe that you want to publish this environment into pre-production, and then you want to swap the URLs after you have done the testing. So the swapping of the URLs you can do very easily. It's a matter of going here and then just uh, checking this one and then clicking swap. So that will swap the URLs. You can also uh, clone the environment. For example, let's say you want to have a copy of your development environment for testing purpose. So it's a matter of selecting that environment. And then uh, you can select, uh, there's an action button, and then click Clone, which will create a copy of that environment. So maybe when you get a bug in your production environment, you want to test it. This is an easy way to clone it. So you give a name, and then click Clone. It will clone the environment, and you will have another similar environment available for you. So we learned about Elastic Beanstalk and how to do the core deployment. Uh, what if you want to do hybrid deployments? Let's say you want to do a deployment to your on-premise environment, to Azure, to Google, and also to an AWS environment. So if you want to do such uh, hybrid deployments, uh, you can use AWS Core Deploy and Azure DevOps. So what we are going to build now is a very special pipeline. I'm going to have uh, two EC2 instances running on AWS, and I'm also going to have my laptop. So we are going to install an agent in these uh, environments, which is the core deploy agent. And then you are going to create a deployment group called pre-production. So you categorize them into a one group. Then like before, I'm going to make a, a, a application, a simple console application in Visual Studio Code, put it into Azure repository, kickstart Azure pipeline. And then in a, with the help of a built agent, I'm going to uh, create a simple zip file, upload into S3 bucket and then invoke AWS Core Deploy API saying that, hey, Core Deploy, take this uh, S3 artifact and then publish. So Core Deploy will communicate with the agent, and agent will pull that S3 artifact and deploy on the machine. You can do rolling deployments if you want. You can do one at a time deployments. So if you want to have minimal downtime. How it works behind the scene is that you have something called an app spec file. So this uh, application. Uh, Manifest tells things like, what are the files you want to copy to the destination? And what lifecycle events that you want to program for? For example, here I can copy some files from source to destination. And there are different lifecycle events that I program for. You also have different lifecycle events. For example, application start, validate, before install, after install. If you can copy a file from source to the destination and execute step, uh, scripts at different stages, 
sky is the limit for deployment. You can deploy MSI packages, uh, EXE applications, uh, SSIS packages, a lot of things you can deploy with this mechanism. So what we are going to learn here is this my donkey application. So you see the now the team, right? The zoo of applications that I'm creating. So this my donkey application is a simple EXE application. Let's see how we can do that. So I have my uh, AWS environment. There, so there are two machines, uh, easy to instance, machine one and machine two. I tag them with the uh, environment key equal to pre-production. So the both machine I have tagged the key as uh, uh, pre-production. So this is how you identify different machines. So once you uh, tag these machines uh, back in my uh, code deploy, what I have done is uh, I have specified in the application, my tag application test. So you specify an application. And inside this application, I have defined a uh, very simple uh, two different deployment groups. So one of the deployment group is called my hybrid, hybrid uh, environment. So if you go into your hybrid environment, you can find that which EC2 instance that it selects. So here I have defined uh, Amazon EC2 instances. One is um, called uh, pre-production. So any, any EC2 instance tag as pre-production will be available. And also on-premise instance, also selected based on that tag. But if you go into the on-premise instance, as of now, I don't have any on-premise instance registered with Amazon. You can register them with an execution of very simple PowerShell commands. So this is my laptop. So it could be your on-premise server. I'm running my uh, code deploy agent behind the scene. It's running as an uh, administrator account. You can find that it's running as a, a local administrator. And uh, what you do is you open the PowerShell. And then if you look at. Uh, this is my laptop. You che check the battery level. So it gets us 92% battery full. So if you search AWS credential list profiles, I have created a profile called Code Deploy Setup. So this Code Deploy Setup profile allows me to register my local instance with AWS. It has the uh, right permissions. So I set the credentials of this PowerShell uh, session to that uh, Code Deploy Setup credentials. I set the default region as up southeast too, which is Sydney region. So this Local instance get registered in Sydney region when I registered. Then I invoke a PowerShell command called register CD on-premise instance. I give it instance name, maybe my laptop, my Lenovo laptop, or any identification you want to have. Then I want to specify a permissions allowed on this laptop. So I already created an IAM user called my on-premise machine user, and I specify Amazon S3 read-only access. Because what I'm going to do is to download the software from Amazon to deploy. So I need to have S3 access, right? So I specify the permissions allowed on Amazon for this laptop. And then I, from the time I press it, enter, it gets registered under on-premise instance. So if you go into the on-premise instance, you can find that my laptop is already registered. Uh, so And you select that. Uh, so we, of course, need to tag this. So we need to tell that this is a pre-production environment. So I give the environment key and then tag it as pre-production. And from that time onwards, it becomes part of the pre-production environment. Right? So all the tagging and registration of on-premise is done. So the next step is to, of course, make some modification and then publish this application. So this is a very simple uh, Hello World console application. It just prints a message called Donkey Eta Mango. So let's look at the app spec YAML file. So in the app spec YAML file, it says what is the source and the destination for the files. Uh, and also it has uh, the scripts that I have programmed for different lifecycle events. So that includes a before install and after install. Maybe you want to stop an instance, or maybe you want to restart an instance, or you want to stop your IIS web server before deploying. So this PowerShell script is a very simple one. It just creates some files on the local folder. It's going to create a folder and then create some files. Uh, but you can add anything uh, that you want to have in these PowerShell scripts. So these are just lifecycle events. So I have this app spec file, which, I, uh, which is part of that zip file I'm going to create. So back in the, my pipeline, uh, I have the Azure uh, pipeline already uh, created. You have the restoration of Nougat packages, building and testing phases as normal uh, artifacts. And then, of course, I'm going to copy that uh, manifest file uh, into the uh, staging directory. So this is that step, all the artifacts that I want to copy. Uh, and then I'm going to create, after I cr copy all these files, I'm going to create a zip file out of all these artifacts. So once the zip file is created, uh, of course, I'm going to upload into S3 bucket. So I use that extension to do that. I give the bucket name, which folder that you want to uh, orchestrate that. And then I invoke a code deploy uh, pipeline, uh, code deploy, and then say, hey, code deploy, uh, refresh your application with this new uh, 
artifact that I publish into S3. So I tell what is my hybrid environment, the deployment group that I want to publish, where to take the uh, S3 artifact from. So from the time that I do that, uh, the next step is to execute the pipeline, of course. So let's change this message. So instead of saying donkey at a uh, mango, let's say donkey at an apple, right? So I save this, and like before, I'm going to, uh, so I maintain my repository uh, changes. So change the message, uh, save the uh, code, and then publish that one with the help of push button, right? So again, this is going to kickstart an Azure pipeline. It's, it's triggered uh, by this any change that it's uh, encountered. So this will execute the pipeline that I showed you a moment ago. So the pipeline is running. You can find that it's executing some steps. I have fast forward this uh, this video. Um, so what will happen is it's going to build uh, your exe application, uh, run some tests if you have it, publish in S3, and then invoke code deploy API to publish this uh, to your servers. So behind the scene, uh, you can find that there is this uh, deployment is in progress. Uh, and you can find that uh, two instances has already been deployed. So these are the EC2 instances. And if you go back, you can see what is the progress of your deployment. So if you have like 100 servers, uh, you can deploy an application easily like this. So it takes a moment to publish into your uh, laptop. Um, you can find that uh, which instance has successfully. So my laptop is still in progress. Uh, after a few minutes, uh, the files will be get copied, and the lifecycle events will uh, happen. So all the three instances have been successfully deployed. So if you go into uh, the events, you can get uh, the logs output. If there's an error, you can see that those errors over here. But in this case, uh, all the steps uh, successfully uh, ran. So back in my laptop, uh, so this is a .NET application. So if I type .NET my donkey app .dll, it will print the message that I change. So. The next section, we are going to learn how you can do uh, container deployment at scale with the help of Amazon Elastic Container uh, Services. And we are going to integrate this one with uh, Azure DevOps. So AWS provides a lot of container orchestration services. So if you are a fan of Kubernetes, uh, we provide uh, Kubernetes, manage Kubernetes uh, clusters. So you focus on your application and building your containers instead of worrying about uh, how you are going to auto-scale, for example. Uh, if you want to have unmanaged experience and if you want, for example, remote login, check what is happening inside the containers, you can have something like Amazon Elastic Container Service. You can run Windows containers on that if you want. If you want to have managed uh, experience of container orchestration and you want to have AWS-specific service, which is tight integrated with AWS services, a Fargate is a good ex uh, uh, example. And if you want to keep your images, uh, we have Amazon Elastic Container Registry, which is like a Docker Hub or Azure Container Registry. Uh, the only difference is that this is tightly integrated with AWS Identity Access Management so that you can easily um, provision uh, images and then say, hey, this is my production environment. That environment should take images only from production repositories. So we'll focus on Fargate and Elastic Container Registry in this demo. So what we are going to build uh, we are going to have a Fargate cluster. Uh, there are going to be a service running, which represents your website. There are going to be two containers running, version one. It's running behind a load balancer, and the users will connect to these containers uh, uh, using that load balancer. So of course, uh, application changes. Developers want to make some changes. They change uh, ASP.NET Core web application, push it into Azure repository, kickstart Azure pipeline. Uh, with the help of a built agent, we are going to create uh, image. So if it's a Linux uh, agent, uh, you, you can create a Linux image, or if it's a Windows agent, you can create a Windows agent. And then I'm going to publish this image into Amazon ECR. And once I publish, uh, I'm going to invoke the service and then say, hey, service, there's a new image. Take that image and then orchestrate these containers. So the version 2 of the containers will become live. Elastic load balancer will direct the traffic into the new uh, containers. And then it will uh, take the traffic off from the all containers, and the all containers will automatically drain after a moment. And they, after that, uh, the containers will vanish, and you will have your website running on the new containers. So this application, uh, going into the theme of uh, Sue of application that I'm creating, is called my Wolf application. Again, I recorded it uh, because uh, for the best interest of time. So let's see how we can do that. So I have my Fargate cluster here. Uh, there's one service running uh, and two tasks. Task is pretty much the container set of containers that I'm running. 
So if you go into this cluster, you can find that my Wolf app website is already set up, right? So this represents maybe your web application. Maybe it's an API endpoint. Maybe it's your batch uh, jobs that you want to run. So in the past, you can find that there are two containers running. Uh, they are all, all in healthy state. So if I go into my service, my Wolf app, you can find that it's in healthy state. I want to have two uh, tasks running, and it's running two tasks. So it's in the desired state. Uh, so it's in running state, and it's in a good health. So what we are going to do is a new deployment. If you look at your load balancer, you can find that uh, behind the load balancer, there are two containers running with the, these two IP addresses. They're all port 80 running, and they're healthy state. So these are the containers that is running, and then these containers are what is behind this load balancer, right? So keep track of these IP addresses. So I have my web application. If you go into that uh, Elastic Load Balancing uh, URL, you have this MyWolf app. If you refresh it, uh, especially with uh, for, uh, Mozilla Firefox kind of browser, you'll see that uh, round robin load balancing, right? This container ID is actually the uh, IP address of those two containers that is printing. Uh, so it's round robin between those two containers. So what I want to do is to publish a new uh, image into this container registry, right? So right now, uh, I have set up my service in a way, hey, service, take the latest image from my uh, container repository and then uh, use it as uh, the image for your service. So the image is already there. So back in my pipeline, uh, I have set up all the normal build steps. Uh, you have .NET Core build steps, which is which will create a web application. And then I'm going to use the uh, typical Docker commands. So see, my whole pipeline here is just a set of commands, right? So I use the Docker build command to build that uh, Docker image. So that will get built inside that built agent. Then I'm going to uh, log in into my Elastic Container Registry. Uh, I'm going to tag the images in the proper URLs. And then I'm going to call Docker push, and then push that image into Amazon ECR. Right? So once the image is there, I'm, I tag it already as latest image. Uh, I'm going to invoke. Uh, so see, I'm using uh, AWS command line interface. I'm going to say, hey, uh, AWS ECS, there's a new image in the repository. Go there and then orchestrate that on Fargate. So like before, uh, we want to make some modification into the web application. So let's check, instead of saying uh, welcome to Fargate, so let's say welcome to Fargate, and let's change the version of this front page uh, message into version 2. So I change it. Uh, so the next thing, obviously, is to save these changes, commit it. So let's put a message to keep track of what uh, went in this application. And then what I'm going to do is to save it, and then like before, publish into uh, Azure repository. Because I'm using a Linux instance here, so I'm programming on Linux here, right? .NET Core is uh, running on Linux. Um, I haven't set up the Active Directory integration properly here, so I put my credentials to log in into Amazon ECR. Uh, and after that, it got published. So you can find that the pipeline automatically kickstarted. Uh, and it's going to now take the image, uh, like build the application, create the image. And the beauty of Amazon ECR is that you don't want to always publish the full image, right? So if you have delta changes and your image is uh, 10 gigabyte, only the delta changes are published into ECR. So if you have a large image, uh, it won't take a long time to upload into ECR. So here you can find that at some stage, when during the publication state, it will say um, there are some uh, Docker layers already existing, so I'm only going to publish the delta changes. Maybe it, those layers only contains your web application changes or the pages, right? So it's going to uh, publish these uh, delta layers into your uh, Docker repository. Um, and once it's published, it's going to invoke uh, Amazon Fargate uh, service and then say uh, there are going to be a new deployment. So if you look at here, from the time I refresh, it's going to get a new deployment. So you can find that the all deployment is already in place. So it's still running. So there's a new deployment that came into place. So what will happen now is that uh, the new deployment has to download that image to the container host. Uh, it's going to start it. So behind the scene, the application is still version 1, right? So what will happen is that it's going to uh, download the image, uh, start the containers. Uh, so while those tasks are happening, still it's running the, uh, the version, right? So the whole deployment is now done. Uh, what will happen is the deployment is uh, completed. And then uh, the deployment is ready. And after a moment, uh, the new containers will become live. And you can find from the time that you refresh, uh, the all uh, container images are still healthy. And the initial ones are the, the, old, uh, the new containers that I publish are in initial state. 
So they need to still pass through the um, health checks of the load balancer. And from the time they pass the uh, load che uh, health checks, you can find that uh, the version 1 and version 2 are interchangeable, right? So you can set how this is going to work. For example, um, you can check the set the time for uh, these uh, containers to become live. But from the time the old containers start draining, right, the new containers will become the, uh, the live one. So we can find that the old containers are now draining, and the new containers are the healthy one. And if you refresh your page, you will find that uh, the whole application is now updated into version 2. So you can find that now it's doing the round robin between the two new containers. So a very common question that is asked is uh, how to manage the secrets, right? Uh, so maybe you want to keep the database connection strings or the passwords. The way to do that is to use a parameter store. You can define uh, the scope that you want to have. You can say, this is my production, uh, finance application, uh, password. So once you define these parameters, you can keep this super secret password here. Uh, you can attach a permission saying that, hey, I, do have, I don't have access to production passwords, but I do have access to a development password. So you do that one with the IAM permissions. Once you have that permission, you attach into either your PowerShell script, to your IAM user, or the instance profile that is running this development machine. And uh, once that, you can access them with the help of PowerShell. You can also access it with uh, help of uh, .NET uh, code if you want. So we already studied like how to manage your secret, how to uh, do all these uh, nice deployment. If you are interested to get your hands dirty and then learn them how to do this, uh, we are going to run some boot camps. It's about 13 hours of hands-on labs. And we will keep in touch with you. And you will get a mail from us. Uh, uh, please feel to attend to this boot camp. And all, everything that I discuss here, we are going to do hands-on labs and then learn how to do that. Hope you enjoyed this session. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, and this is uh, my contact details. Please keep in, in touch.